Okay, remember a while back we talked about global wind patterns? What we're going to do now is we're going to look at how these global wind patterns are affected by global warming. <clears throat> so if you recall, uh, there are three major convective cells. There's the main one is the Hadley cell. So the Hadley cell is caused by strong convective heating at the equator. Convection carries warm, moist air upwards, which then uh, the water vapor then condenses. So you get a lot of rain uh, and, and rainforest at the equator. <clears throat> now as that air continues to move, it goes about 30 uh, degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator, and then it descends. And then it moves back towards the equator, completing this convection cycle. Now, when it comes down, it's dry because it lost its moisture on the way up. So we find most of the world's major deserts are located either 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south-ish. Okay. Now, as these winds move from uh, the poleward direction towards the equatorial direction, they get deflected. And they get deflected in such a way that the winds end up blowing uh, from east to west, or really from northeast to southwest, form what we call the trade winds. And the trade winds are the, the strongest, most regular uh, global wind systems on the planet because they're driven by a very reliable and strong uh, convection cell. <clears throat> now, uh, as I said, as the air rises here at the equator, we can see that there's this belt of green here. Uh, well, the equator goes right through here and, and rising air is moist, it carries water vapor up, which then condenses and comes down as rain. So we get a green belt all the way across the equator, but then 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, we get these deserts because that's where the Hadley cell is coming down. And then it's gonna go back to the equator. It rises at the equator and it sinks north and comes back, but on, on its way towards the equator, it gets deflected this way. It rises here, sinks here, making deserts. As it moves towards the equator, it gets deflected this way. And so we get these, these trade winds that blow between, say, 20 degrees and the equator, uh, moving uh, in, in a westerly direction. <clears throat> so in the subtropical area, say between 24 and 34 degrees, this is where we're going to find most of our deserts. And between, say, 20 degrees and the equator is where we're going to find these strong trade winds. Oh, yay. What does global warming do to this? Well, what happens is this. <clears throat> As the atmosphere gets warmer, you shouldn't be surprised to figure out that there's going to be uh, more solar energy converted to heat, which means there's, and most of that's going to be the equator. So what that means is essentially that there's going to be increased uh, equatorial convection happening in the Hadley cell. So, now, now, so you would think that makes it stronger. In a way it does, but look what happens. What it really does is it expands. So it's what we're seeing is instead of the air landing at 30 degrees, like it has done, you know, for you know, probably since, I don't know how long, this is even before the last ice age. Uh, what's happening now is <clears throat> it's, as it warms up, it's moving farther away from the equator, more like 35 to 40 degrees away. Now, remember, the rising air is very moist and that will continue to happen. We'll still get lots of rain at the equator, but the descending dry air, instead of landing at 30 degrees, is now starting to land farther north and farther south of that. And so that's causing us changes in the weather patterns in those locations from what they used to be, which were very temperate to, to very dry now. So we see is, is in these regions here where there used to be reliable rains, uh, now we're tending to get very dry descending air uh, that causes uh, uh, lack of rain, which makes people have to irrigate more. We get crop failure. Uh, we got a host of problems associated with over irrigation. Uh, we tend to get uh, desertification, um, soil depletion, and uh, an increased incidence of forest fires, like the 2020 fire season in California is a classic example. It's California is right in this region here, and and California is being dried out. It's in, in the midst of of a very prolonged mega drought, and part of that reason is because of the the northward uh, expansion of the northern hemisphere Hadley cell. <clears throat> Now, uh, well, what that tends to do is, is it dries out, or the soils dry out. And as the soils dry out, well, they produce less. Now, it's true, we can irrigate them, but when we're not irrigating them, as they tend to dry out, uh, they become less and less productive. We end up uh, where we have exposed soil. Once we have exposed soil, it's bad, because then you start getting, when it does rain, you tend to get a lot of erosion uh, and in major soil depletion. You get wind erosion, water erosion. So it, this leads to desertification, which is exactly what happened at 30 degrees, is now starting to move farther away from there. Now, 
Another thing that happens is this, as this Hadley cell moves northward, what's happening is instead of landing here at 30 degrees, it's landing here more closer to 40 degrees. So it's, it's covering a greater distance. And one consequence of that, one observable consequence of that is that these winds, these surface winds, they're encountering a greater extent of friction. So they're not moving as quickly. So we've noticed is there's been this diminishment in the strength of the trade winds in recent years. And these trade winds, if you recall, are responsible for holding the warm pool in the western part of the Pacific Ocean uh, and also for producing upwelling off the, the western coasts of the continents, and most notably the one off Peru, which is the world's most productive uh, oceanic uh, ecosystem. But what's happening now is with these things weakening, the upwelling is diminishing and we're getting uh, more more frequent and prolonged and um, wider distributed El Nino events. Remember, El Nino is when that warm pool comes back across the Pacific Ocean, and that's happening to a greater extent, largely because of this weakening of these trade winds. Because basically, that's what El Nino is, is the weakening of these trade winds. Well, these, these trade winds are weaker to start with. <clears throat> now let's talk about the jet streams. So if you recall, so this might be hard for you to view. So here's the North Pole, here's the equator, and we have the Hadley cell, we have the polar cell where the cold air descends at the North Pole and it rises around 60. This is okay. And then we have the feral cell, sometimes what's called the mid latitude cell, sort of stuck in between. Okay. So it's going to do, uh, you know, it's going to rise on the same size as the polar and sink on the same size as the Hadley. So we get this, this cycle here. This is what makes the westerly winds. This is the winds that bring us the lovely Gobi Desert yellow dust. Now, <clears throat> in between these cells, we get what are called the jet streams. There's the subtropical jet. Uh, which is a little bit higher up uh, and, and less influential, I would say. But the, the most influential one is the polar jet, which happens around 60-ish degrees, okay? And, and this one is definitely being affected largely by warming of the polar regions, as we talked about in a previous um, episode. So what happens is this. The strength of the jet stream, which, remember, these things blow like 200 kilometers an hour, uh, 200 kilometers an hour or faster, uh, these winds are, are basically driven by the temperature difference between the polar cell and the feral cell or mid-latitude cell. The greater the temperature, oops, the greater the temperature difference between these two areas, the stronger these winds blow. All right. Now we find is, is if the difference, if the, if the temperature difference between them weakens or diminishes, then the winds weaken, they blow with, with less vigor. So we find is... <clears throat> When the polar regions are, are very cold compared to the mid latitudes, then these jet streams blow very fast. And when they blow very fast, they tend to, to they always have a little bit of these what are called troughs, a little bit of waviness to them, right? But here's what we've been noticing lately. Because the polar region is warming much more quickly than the rest of the planet, that makes the temperature difference significantly less, right? There's, there's not as much. This isn't as much colder than this region here because this region is warming. As a consequence, these winds are slowing down. And when they slow down, they become a lot more wavy. So we've noticed this diminishment in the speed of these uh, the, the, the polar jet stream. Uh, and then the reason is because the, the, the polar regions are not as, uh, and this is particularly pronounced in the Arctic as opposed to the Antarctic, because there's much more warming of the Arctic region. Uh, and, and so we, we get these deeper troughs. So here's a trough, here's a trough, okay? We call this a warm trough and a cold trough. Well, what that means is, <clears throat> as the jet becomes very wavy, if you recall, like the United States had a very, very pronounced cold snap, they call it a cold event that happened, uh, really affected where the power in Texas went out as a result of it. And that's because the jet stream is so wavy now because it's slowing down so much. And what happens is that allows these polar vortexes or just cold air off the pole to come deep into uh, the, the northern continents. Uh, but it, in the summertime, it has the opposite effect, which is it allows these warm air to move farther north, and we get these pronounced, prolonged um, warm spells. And because these are such deep troughs, such, such very high amplitude waves, that we tend to get these, these weather systems of either warm heat waves in the summer or cold waves, you want to call them in the wintertime, they, they tend to last a lot longer. Okay, so that's how global warming is affecting global wind patterns. Next, we're going to see what does that do to the Earth's um, uh, ocean currents. So...